Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John. This is episode 142. I'm just in from working out, so you might be happy that uh, you're not standing next to me because I smell. But uh, I'm very pleased about this. Uh, the, the questions this week are nice. They're, they're, there's a couple of them that I, got me thinking a little bit. I actually looked up a few things. Uh, remember, if you have questions, email them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, sometimes we, Brian and I, the we of Brian and I, will talk about the fact that I tend to answer a lot of the same questions a lot. But this is also the modern way we do things where uh, people don't uh, don't spend a lot of time looking things up. Uh, this week, though, there's some. There's actually a couple questions I'm, I'm looking forward to answer. So let's get going then, okay? Remember, podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Our first question is very short, but it's a good question. Jesse asks, to keep up with strength, what type of eating would be most appropriate? And boy, I tell you, Jesse, if you want to upset people, I mean, you know, the other day I... I, I I poked fun at a political uh, figure, which I always think is okay. I think, I think it's okay to pick fun of political figures. I think it's fun to, uh, I mean, you know, anybody who's in power needs to be tweaked. I think that's the job of a comedian. And they they got all offended. When I was growing up, talking about religion and politics was something you never would talk about at a party. And now, of course, you, it's, probably sports would be included in there too. You just have to be careful. It's a, it's a, those are all landmines uh, for conversations, but I'm going to add this. I'm going to say uh, eating <laughs> boy. You can upset people when you talk about something as simple as style of eating What Jesse asks. So the thing is Jesse Olympic training center, 1984, the, the nutritionist walked out and said, I don't know what the big deal is. More, more protein, more veggies and drink water. Uh, Years later, Rob Wolf told me, I don't know what the issue is, more fiber, more fiber, more fish oil, more protein. Uh, I thought that those two sentences, those two little paragraphs are about all you ever need to know. Um, For strength, though, people can get freakishly strong uh, with the worst possible diets in the world. Um, there's probably, you know, when you talk to the great power lifters, one of the things they usually talk about as much as their, their chains, their bands, their, you know, their compression, their this, their that is what's for breakfast. I mean, these guys can eat and it's, it's amazing to watch. Um, if you're an, a super heavyweight, an unlimited lifter, a strong person, um, diet, this <laughs> diet is shoveling everything you possibly can down your gullet. Uh, I, I, but there's the other side of it. You know, I always break things up into basically five categories, okay? Health, which is the optimal interplay of the human organs. And for your health, you probably need to drink water. Uh, you need protein. You need fats. You need carbohydrates. Uh, the sources uh, should be <clears throat> comfortable for you to consume. Uh, like in my case, I'm allergic to uh, lobster and crab. And so those are not things that I would gain weight on. I would basically get choked out on. Um, Some of you might have religious issues or food intolerances and food allergies and flat out, you know, uh, uh, immune system issues that don't allow you to eat certain foods. Some of you might be from an an area that specializes in certain foods and um, those would probably be the best things you could ever have. I remember Dr. Jarvis always talking about how you should uh, focus on what he called your human house. Uh, eat what your ancestors ate, which there's some wisdom there. Um, if you're, you know, if you're a Viking stock, I mean, you're probably going to get away with some fish and seafood uh, as a pretty good idea because that's what you ate. And uh, supplement it with, uh, when I'm always in Sweden and Norway, I'm always interested in the different berries that they eat and the different breakfasts they eat because they have uh, vegetables, fruits, and foods that are different than what we can grow here where I live. Uh, I have a a beehive uh, right here, and I'm going to be eating um, (laughs) locally grown honey this year. 
I, I grow my own little uh, allow to say I actually, I, I would never survive on the food I grow, but you know, I may, I have my own tomatoes. I have my own mint. I have my own herb garden. Uh, this year I'll have corn, uh, black beans and squash. They're called the three sisters. If I'm eating things that are coming out of my garden, they, they, they tend to be better for me as a kid. I could, I always struggle with oranges, tomatoes. I get these little things here. Okay, so uh, because the the acidicness of those things were just too hard for my my lips. Okay, so after all, oh, so and then there's religious things you probably can't eat. So after all those caveats uh, for strength, uh, I still think that you need protein. Now I think we overdid protein for a whole bunch of my career, but I still would say that protein is a pillar, and then you really need to make sure you have it. Uh, essential fats are often overlooked. Um, of course, I've, I've been a fan of fish oil since I since the 1980s when I um, when I first first read Phil Maffetone's book. When I was reading some of these other people, I don't know if the book's even around anymore. But uh, um, these were books that really pushed fish oil, and I've always found that for me, uh, the seafood, anything from the sea, outside of crab and lobster, seemed to really uh, do well with my body. Uh, when I eat foods from the sea, I, I pick up my fish oils and I pick up my protein. Uh, from there, there's that whole world of carbohydrates. And I would, I would always push people into um, more vegetables and more fermented foods. Uh, here as an American, you're going to get grain. Grain's in everything. And you're going to get corn. Corn's in everything. You're going to get soy. Soy's in everything. Eh, you know, I could run on that a little too long. But I think... I think it comes down to this. I, I can't recommend in toto simply just eating anything that comes along because it's so difficult on your health. So health is the optimal interplay of the human organs, okay? So to be healthy, um, you, you should have foods that are probably diverse, probably fiber of some kind in it, inappropriate uh, in the fat and protein family. You can where you go with carbohydrates is going to be on a number of other things. So for fitness, now fitness uh, is the ability to do a task. Um, I, I always think that Dr. Sheehan's great insight is the only thing that matters for a, an appropriate dial, uh, diet is a bowel movement before you run. And I always thought that was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> so for fitness, you know, whatever, you know, if a food gets in your way, like for example, like, Last summer, I was a, at in England at an Olympic lifting meet, and I, I had a great case of diarrhea. Well, the diarrhea in, impacted my Olympic lifting, so whatever I ate, don't eat. Uh, for longevity, uh, you know, it's still a bit of a mixed bag about what works. Uh, it does seem that the uh, the over the counter drug here in the United well, not over the counter. I apologize. Uh, it's a very commonly prescribed uh, thing called metformin or glucophage which comes from the French lilac bush. It's been around well over 100 years. Seems to have an impact on longevity. So there is a pill. Walking seems to help with longevity. Uh, being connected to other humans seems to help with longevity. Um, whether red wine, coffee, dark chocolate, uh, fermented foods help with longevity is still kind of a, well, we'll see. For performance, if performance is back to fitness, you know, uh, Dr. Sheehan's advice is actually really uh, more valuable than you think. If you ever want to find out the importance of, of why I talk about bowel movements so much, get constipated at a really important event and then get back to me about the importance of this kind of thing. But performance, you don't want to be, you don't want your food to get in the way and that's kind of its job. And then the fifth one, of course, is body composition or how you look you know, in the mirror, on the beach, or naked. And that, I would still, I, I read this week that an article said that you, intermittent fasting is, isn't necessary, but uh, the, one of the reasons I'm a fan of intermittent fasting, a lot of the people who I look up to in the, in the industry, in body composition, recommend, uh, it's funny, it, it seems to swirl around a couple ideas. Uh, intermittent fasting shows up all the time. Walking shows up a lot in body composition. Um, appropriate weight training shows up. And that I, I, and I'm using the word appropriate for a good reason there. Because appropriate weight training isn't beating yourself to death. 
because if you work too hard, and this comes out right out of the work of, uh, you know, someone I have great respect for, uh, Clarence Bass, you know, uh, Clarence Bass, if you work too hard, you start losing muscle, not fat. Yeah, you'll lose 20 pounds, but it might be 16 pounds of muscle and four pounds of fat, which is not what you want to do. But for strength, and because strength is such a long-term commitment to get stronger, I think you should make sure you eat a diet that uh, a type of eating, a style of eating that you can do over and over and over and is going to be an N equals one experience of one kind of thing. If a certain food, uh, a guy like me is telling you, eat this, eat this, eat this, and it makes you sick to your stomach, well, don't eat it. And if a certain food, and you know, I'm a big fan of, of, of exploring food by like eating a food. Uh, that's one of the great insights, Phil Maffetone's two week uh, Maffetone diet, where he limits you down to certain foods. And then you add logically one food back over a period. Um, basically for those of you who have ever done the two week Maffetone trial, it's, well, it's, it's basically what Rob Wolf would have told you. It's what you read in the book, uh, lights out. It's, you know, basically you, for two weeks, you're eating, uh, vegetables, uh, fruits. There are some fruit restrictions, I think. And then really, uh, the, 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 the meats and fowl and things like that are as close to you can. So you don't eat salami. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure you eat pork products, but you know, you eat, uh, you eat salmon, not salami. I mean, wow, what a, what a shock. And I, you might want to look into the work of Maffey Tone on that. His website has it. Of course, it's also in the book, uh, Natural Born Heroes, uh, uh, by the guy who wrote the book about barefoot running, uh, McDougal, I think it is. I think there's value to doing something like the two week. Uh, you could also get the same insights from the Atkins diet, but Maffetone uh, argues that you add this food this week and you, you, you see how it impacts you. Then you add another food. Then you add another food. If it's, if it's a positive impact, you keep it. If it's negative, bye-bye for a while. And I think that's the way we should do it in the strength world. Okay? Do the Maffetone test or something similar. See what hurts and helps when you eat it. And then just do your best to uh, take care of your nutritional needs with foods that agree with you. Thank you. Got a question from Jordan. I am 28 years old and have been consistently lifting for 10 plus years and would consider myself a high intermediate to low advanced lifter. Over the past year, in an attempt to add more volume, I've been running a five to six day week push-pull split with good success, but the total volume has become too much for a natural and I would like to give myself more recovery time. Well, if you're a low advanced lifter and you're still training six days a week on a split, uh, yeah, of course the volume's going to kill you. I mean, that's just that's just the way it is. I mean, this this bodybuilding notion of doing this stuff, of, of doing these, you know, double sessions six days a week, uh, I don't know anybody natural who can do it. Uh, the power lifters will tell you, yeah, we, we take anabolics. And that's why we can do this stuff. If you don't, I don't know how you do it. Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as, as, as a truth. My question is, what is your opinion on three days a week, old school, full body workouts for mass? I have done mass made simple in the past. Remember, that's just six weeks though. And I have great prog progress from high rep squats. However, I'm looking for a higher volume approach for this training block, but more manageable load from a push pull or body part split. Well, I mean, it's, <clears throat> I have an idea for you. It's pretty, it's, when you say old school, a lot of the guys did three whole body workouts a week. You'd see that in Reg Park and you'd see everybody, uh, all the authors from the 30s and 40s and 50s would all tell you the same thing. One of the first good push-pull I have ever saw, body part splits, was this. So on day one, uh, let's just say Monday, it's lower body day. And you go in there and you do your high rep squats, you do your leg extension, your leg or whatever nonsense you're doing for lower body. And you're going to have to figure out what you mean by lower body. Uh, if you do high rep back squats and you know deadlifts, cleans, snatches, hip thrusts, leg press, leg curl, leg extension, you know, on day one, that's going to be a hard, hard workout to recover from. Day two is upper body. 
Okay, so day one, you focus lower body. Day two, Wednesday, uh, is a upper body workout. And that's your push, you know, your vertical, horizontal push and pull, uh, and whatever else you consider upper body, your guns, you know, your whatever nonsense you're doing. And then the third day of the week, which could be Friday, I would recommend actually Saturday, is you do all the exercises from day one to day two, Monday and Wednesday, but you do them at at 80% of the load and if appropriate for you, 80% of the volume. It's going to be something you're going to have to test over the few weeks. So if you're doing a light workout like you're back squatting 405 for 20 on Monday, um, you know, Saturday could be 315 for 20. And if the volume's too high, you can go 315 for 16 reps. Okay, I'm just tweaking you there. I've done that workout, and that's why I think it's funny. When people talk about being advanced, I like to bring out my 405 for 20, which, which is not that great. Tom Platts used to do that a couple of times a week, four sets of 20 with 405. Um, but, you know, if you do something like that, where you do this for a, this high rep Monday back squat, uh, you, 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 you then on Saturday, you repeat it. But remember what's going to happen is you're going to do your back squat, your deadlift, your clean, your squat, your then you're going to do your push, pull hinge, you know, your push, pull, your upper, your lefty, your righty, your gun. You're going to do everything on, but at 80%. And I'm going to probably recommend at, at, in the beginning to do 80% on volume too. Um, if you're doing five sets of five on Monday, you do four sets of five on Saturday or even you could do five sets of five on Monday and four sets of four. No one does four sets of four. Five sets of five on Monday and three sets of three on Saturday. Yeah, it's a huge drop in volume, but it would make sense to do it uh, because it's such a long workout. Now, you're only going to have, if you do it Saturday, you're only going to have the, the 48 hours to recover from that, from Monday's hard workout. But that's okay because, you know, you've, you've had a whole week to recover from last Monday's workout. So that's that's just one day to do it. I, I hope there's I hope there's some clarity there for you. So this is just an idea, an idea that I've done and it works. My transformation program is based on this. So day one, lower body, hard. Day two, upper body, hard. Day three, whole body, reasonable, however you get to reasonable. Thank you, Jordan. I, I hope that helps. Got a question from Chris. Chris says, and this is an a, a, a interesting uh, question because I have a book on it. I'm curious there's a, if there is a place you discuss ways to focus mental and emotional distractions during competition so you can maximize performance when competing regardless of external circumstances or setbacks. Yeah, I wrote a book. And the book is called Now What? And then there's a question mark behind it. Uh, now what is a phrase I use after the nationals, after the state meet, after the season's over, I lean in and I say, well, now what, you know, now, now what are we going to do? And then what we do is we, we review not just the marks, not just the performance, but then we also review where was your head? Um, there's three, there's three parts to, the, to this triad. The first is where, where was your physical tension? How much you know, you need a lot of tension to deadlift, but you don't need very much tension to throw the discus bar. You need a lot of arousal to do certain things. I got to be ready to go. I'm about to take on this person. You need much less arousal to snatch or to throw the discus. And then, of course, you need to dial in your heart rate. Um, the, that, that's a major part of the book. I, t I give you tons of ideas and I, on how to practice raising your tension and lowering your tension. Raise your arousal, lower your arousal. Raise your heart rate, lower your heart rate. And then from there, we talk about appropriate practice. And that's, to me, the most important thing of all. The mistake most people do is they just keep practicing. They keep doing stuff. But they don't practice appropriately. You need to practice where your heart rate needs to be in competition. You need to have your brain uh, at the level it needs to be in competition. You need to have your physical uh, tension where it needs to be in, in competition. So, yeah. So, Chris, yeah. Now what? Buy it at On Target Publishing. If you buy it at otpbooks.com, you'll also get the ebook versions and the Audible uh, in, in addition to the book itself. And that's a much better deal than you'll get on the uh, 
the bookstore that owns all of us authors. Okay, thank you. Wow, we have a question from Harsh Vardam. My profession is being a lawyer requires long hours of standing, which includes waiting in a crowded courtroom, arguing the case, etc. Whenever I have to stand for more than usual, I experience stress in my lower back, knees, and ankles. I'm 5'10 and 108K, so you're you're much heavier than I am, at, and, you're, and you're shorter. And so before we even slide into the conversation, let's make sure we asterisk that, okay? And I have started to lose my weight slowly and surely through protein, veggies, and water. Good for you. Apart from losing weight, what in your view are the best exercises one can do for my ability to stand long hours? Uh, I, I really appreciate this question because, you know, years ago I'd have a totally different answer. First, I would like to see you probably lose, um, I, five, ten. I, would, I wouldn't mind seeing you lose maybe a kilo a month or even maybe even less, half a kilo a month for a while. And if you do the protein, veggies, water, you get good sleep. And that's tough in your career because of the weird pressure you're under. Try to get eight or nine hours of sleep. And I know you might be thinking that'll be the hardest thing I do. Um, if you are lifting weights, after every weightlifting session, go for a walk. Um, if you only have an hour to work out, it would be a half hour weight workout and a half hour walk. Um, if you have two hours to work out, you <laughs> half hour, <laughs> half hour weight room and an hour and a half walk. Uh, walking is going to be good for your, your body f- composition. And it uh, might also be good for your issues you're here. Having said that, so let's, okay, let's review so far. Food, protein, veggies, water, sleep, walk, weight lift, then walk as appropriate. Okay. Um, if you have questions, go to danjohnuniversity.com, sign up, and memorize Easy Strength for Fat Loss. But there's another issue here, and I'm concerned about is when you stand, you experience stress in your lower back, knees, and ankles, which makes me think that we, one thing I would like you to look into, I don't know what your insurance is like, or, or uh, 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 your, you know, if you're friends with medical doctors. I think it might be worth your time to go see a a podiatrist, a foot doctor, and have your feet looked at. So if, and and from there, we're going to move up, you know, but if you're wearing inappropriate shoes, what you, if you have narrow toed shoes that are crunching your baby toes up like this, and, you know, they look great, but they're messing with your arch. Your, I think you have three arches in your foot. And, and instead of your, your foot arching up nicely, your foot is getting crushed. That foot getting crushed is going to mess up the ankle. The ankle is connected to the, to the knees. The knee is, gonna, is connected to the hip. And then the hip is going to say, forget it. We'll throw this back up to the back. The best thing I think you can do for your back, and this comes from Stu McGill, is go for a walk. But if your feet hurt, you can't go for a walk. But the problem with your feet is the shoes. So very simply, I'd like you to look into, you know, it might, you could do something as simple as this. I mean, whenever you get back to the office, first thing you do is pop your shoes off and walk around. It'd be nice if you had even like, there's those mats that that have like stones where you walk on them and they, I don't have one because I do a lot of barefoot walking, but. They say that if all you can do is just walk on those little, that they're weird looking, they're rubber and they look like they have stones, but it just kind of opens your feet up. I've noticed the same walking on the beach. Uh, Walking on the beach, for me, when I had my total hip and walked on the beach, I would say five to seven days a week, my back felt so good. I decided to start Olympic lifting (laughs) with, all this titanium in my leg uh, because I just felt great. So whatever you can do to release the heat out of the feet, uh, I think is going to be a good thing. And now, obviously, if the feet aren't the aren't the solution, then start looking uh, upward. You know, um, maybe the podiatrist can help you with ankles or your your general ph- physio or physical therapist. The knees, I would be surprised 
if they were the the problem by themselves because for the back anyway um, and then slide up to the hip and slide up to the spine but I think that's that's the way it would go continue this body weight loss and I told you what to do there uh, look into your shoes and your feet and then from there look up look upstream um, to see if it could you know it could be some relatively simple solution like like more walks or something as simple as you needed a you needed a good massage, you know, behind your hamstrings. I'm just making that up. But it could be something shockingly simple for you, okay? As it sometimes is when you're experiencing pain. The solutions sometimes can be oddly, barely, fairly simple. Thank you. We have a question from Kyle. Kyle starts off with, I mentioned that I work with, with the military a lot. And I, he has actually a very specific thing. I shouldn't really, uh, generally I don't. I, I'm, uh, when I mention it, I mention it in passing. I don't make a big deal out of it. But can you elaborate on training tactics, techniques you have used with this group? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think my best work is post-deployment. Um, uh, if you read uh, my my book, Attempts, I have the entire program in it. And again, get attempts through on-target publishing, uh, on-target publishing, and if you buy it, you buy the book there, then you get the the audio version and the ebook versions all for free. Whereas the you know the big uh, the big sellers don't. You have to buy all those separate and it adds up. the The book itself will be cheaper, but everything else will add up to more. Yeah. So the post deployment work is my best. My uh, the work I do is called resilience. Uh, the training program we use is called resilience, and that and my whole workshop called bounce, which is available here on on, on my site and on YouTube. Um, is the basics of what I do. Uh, obviously, uh, I keep adding to it, and in my new book, I'll expand on it even more. But most of it is just being resilient. Um, when I work with these uh, groups, I, one of the things I emphasize is that I want them to be like a chain link fence, strong but flexible, flexible but strong, and that that's a, that comes right out of that workshop. Um, specifically, do you typically utilize Olympic lifts? Yes, as appropriate. Easy strength, very much. Kettlebells, yes, as appropriate. All of the above. So the answer is, yeah, everything. And it just, it sort of kind of depends on what they want. When I first started working with the community, there was only two kinds. There were either triathletes or bodybuilders. I mean, these guys would talk about, I mean, they'd either, they either acted like they were, you know, Olympic bicyclists the way they talked to me, or they were just pure bro science the way they would talk to me. And the truth is, Neither is a good solution for the needs and wants of the modern military. Uh, neither option is good. Uh, no one cares how you look, and junk, uh, just junk cardio is fine, but if you have to pick your buddy up and carry him 10 kilometers, like my friend did. My friend carried his, his, his uh, companion. They both got blown up, and my, my friend with a lot of shrapnel in his body picked up his buddy and carried him for 10 kilometers, six miles. I don't know how you, you don't train that. That comes from here. That comes from here. And that comes from here. And I mean, what I'm talking about here, I'm talking about real true courage. So that's a little different for this group. I assume safety and injury prevention and training is paramount. Read the post deployment program. In your experience, does an operator particularly need barbell strength or is a bodyweight kettlebell work sufficient? Um, I think they need barbell work because you need to be strong, but you also need to be flexible and mobile and fast and have a ton of endurance. Um, also, I know that running rucking is a big part of their training, by us, but I assume uh, they are coming to you to get stronger. No, actually, we talk a lot about rucking. One of the things I've gotten them to do uh, is slide away from those 85-pound rucks all the time and get into something like heavy hands where we're using physics to disperse the weight. So, you know, if you take if you take a 10-pound weight, uh, 4 kilo, 10-pound weight, 4 kilo in each hand, and you walk with big arm swings, just that, uh, go, go for a, go, go have your 
a family member drop you 10 miles from your house and you have to walk like this home, you know, uh, 15, 16 kilos, uh, uh, kilometers from your house and you have to walk home with that and you actually do that. Oh, you'll hate my guts for the rest of your life. So yeah. So Kyle, yeah, we, everything you said is true. Um, you'll see the program. It's one of my programs for them in post deployment. If you're on the site, it's in there in its entirety. Plus the, it's got the workout generator to show you how to do it. And that maybe is the easiest way to do it. But um, get yourself out of that model that we had back in, you know, I mean, I, I love the movie uh, 300 uh, when it first came out. Mark Twight is a, is a good friend of mine. He's the guy who trained the actors. But we got to get ourselves out of this model of, you know, six-pack abs and all that. Okay? All right. Thank you. Andreas. I am 21 years old and started weightlifting last summer. I love training and want to get quite good at weightlifting. My all-time PR goals are a 130 snatch for my Americans 286 and a 170 clean and jerk. Uh, what is 170? Uh, uh, three, 374. Uh, in in uh, it's 374 I think in uh, uh, pounds. Clean and jerk. Those are good numbers. I'm at about 60 percent now. Okay, that's those are good numbers. You know, those are those are lifts I lifted. You know, when I was a hundred and 110 kilo lifter. Yeah. Uh, currently, I train five times a week, two to two and a half hours each session. I do a lot of accessory work and a bit of squat, deadlift, bench for strength. Yeah, I I would recommend that you if you're gonna get one, a 130 and a 170, you need to get rid of all the nonsense and focus on those. But I was thinking of increasing my volume during the summer since I have more free time. After I heard about your easy strength program, I was wondering if you think I should train less or whether that program is primarily for older people or people with little time. Ouch, man, Andreas, damn, ouch, Ow, hurt, my, hurt my heart. Is easy strength for Olympic lifting a good program? Yeah, you, you, five days a week, you snatch and clean and jerk and front squat. It's a good program. Uh, it is basically how the best and brightest do it, uh, except we we add an, a walk at the end of it. If you did, I mean, if you warmed up with the snatch complex, and you probably need more warm up reps than I would, uh, and you also need more practice. But say you did the three sets of three and the okay, so you do the snatch complex to warm up, and then uh, you you. You do the snatch and you warm up to a, a load that's three sets of three. You clean and jerk, warm up, and then you do the six singles in the clean and jerk. And then you do two sets of two in the front squat because you're warm, ready to go. And those are big numbers. Nah, you you, you could get very strong. You get very strong. It, it just, Andreas, every program works. It's what, you, it's what this and this are doing. It's what your head and heart are doing. Uh, you could get freakishly strong if all you had was a stick and a garbage can and you had the will to be great. Um, so yeah, yes, it would work, but it's going to be about what you bring to the party. I currently do not take any PEDs or plan to in the near future. I don't think you should take any ever. You're 21 years old and starting out of sport. I mean, even if you get really, really good, you're still going to be, well, 25 you know it's yeah uh it, i don't know i heat i eat the healthiest i know of and try to get between seven and nine hours of sleep every night okay no more try on that you must i want eight to nine hours of sleep every night any feedback from someone with your knowledge and experience would be great andreas first off finally uh i am impressed that you're doing this those are good numbers those are good numbers and uh if you focus on just those two goals and compete at them, the 130 and 170, uh, all your dreams will come true. It's Those are good goals. You're going to have a, a lot of power explosion. You're going to have great flexibility and mobility. So simplify things and follow those goals. Thank you. Got a question from Jordan. Uh, it's a long question. I have been following something like an easy strength program with kettlebells for about six months, and I've had great results. Good. Thank you. One thing I still find curious is that all the fundamental movements, push, pull, hinge, squat, carry, have a complementary or 
opposite movement except for the loaded carry. Push-pull are complementary, upper body movements, as are the hinge squat for the lower body. I saw you use a square to illustrate the idea in a YouTube video, and loaded carry was out of the diagram. But there is something that complements it, so hang in there. I'll, I'll give you the answer in just a second. Do you think there is a movement that is a natural complement to the loaded carry in the way that push-pull, hinge squat are complementary? My best idea was hollow body movements, such as the floor L sit or toes to bar. You're, you've already come up with it. But maybe there's something about loaded carries that's just unique. I was curious if you had any thoughts on it. Yeah, A, loaded carries are just unique. Well, it's we call it the sixth movement. I don't talk about the sixth movement because uh, most people simply... Honestly, it doesn't matter what I say. People get confused. I don't know what I do that's so complicated. But the sixth movement is basically, for most of us, and I'm just going to simplify it down, is crawling, climbing. So you got carries, crawling, climbing, the three Cs. Loaded carries, I think, work for every strength athlete. Climbing, including monkey bars, rope climbing, uh, those little things you see in the gym wall, those little, when you do the thing up like that. I think those are marvelous. Now, if you can't do those, get on the ground and crawl. Crawling by itself is remarkable. So the complementary to carrying is climbing and crawling. That's a lot of C's in one sentence. And we'll <laughs> see you at the gym. <laughs> Got a question from Eric. I'd like to add in the clean and press into my workout routine. Well, then do it. Good question. I work out alone at home in my garage. Should I try to do the clean and catch the weight on my shoulders? Or is it okay to catch it in the same grip that I would use for pressing? Oh, oh, okay. I am thinking it would be better to, to do the latter. Now, I never pressed in competition. Now, I've pressed a lot of weight but never because they got rid of it in 1972 and I didn't start Olympic lifting until right after that but that was a conversation that Dick Notmer explained to me a lot Dick loved talking about the press so I heard a lot and uh, there are some people who would clean it and then slide their hands out but what he said was that almost universally the perfect clean grip was the perfect press grip and I thought to myself huh I'll remember that when you do kettlebell work, it's a little easier, of course, you know, because you've got the, you know, you got the, 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 the hand set. It's like dumbbells, you know, the, you don't have to work together as much. You know, if I clean here and I want to slide the hand out a little bit, I just slide the hand out. I don't have to do it like on the barbell. Um, if you can, try to clean the weight with the grip you want to press it, I think. Dick Notmeyer taught me that. Your mileage may vary. Second, have you tried to do your program like even easier strength but switch the focus between main and assistant exercises? For example, one day would be vertical pull with military press as an assistant exercise. Oh, oh, okay. I I'm with you now. So like uh, you're going to have a hard three sets of three um, um, pull-up day with loaded pull-ups and then you're going to do maybe like one set of 10 with the military. I haven't done that, but there's some wisdom in that. And Eric, if you decide to do that, let me know how it goes. The only problem is it's hard enough for me to explain easy strength without having any variations at all. I get, I, I, I explained easy strength, even easier strength as well as I can, and people still don't get it. So you're going to do that and you're going to get back to me, okay? And if it works, I'm going to take full credit for it, okay? All right. It's a good idea. It's a good idea. Can you understand, though, I hope, why I wouldn't write about that? Because that's just going to throw people off. And I think it's stupid simple. But, you know, I also got really, really good grades. And I have a lot of degrees. And I was a professor at two different schools and two different disciplines. So maybe, maybe I'm just smarter and prettier than everybody else. <laughs> that was a joke. Okay. I am. Okay. Hey, listen, Eric, that's a good question. I want you to try it. You know, don't, don't overthink it. Maybe do it. I don't know. If you're working out five days a week, try it in two of the workouts 
and try in those two workouts to do that for maybe three weeks. And then just kind of go, okay, yeah, it works. I maybe you know one thing you might feel is that you're focusing hard on the, uh, the pull up, and the military might be very refreshing after that, and that's a nice sign. Okay, well that's it for this week. Boy, that was a those are good questions. Thank you all for emailing them. Um, remember, if you have questions, uh, uh, just send them to what is it again? Oh yeah, podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Um, I was, I've been shocked in the last few months that even though some of the questions sound like we've heard them before, there have been some u- unique takes on these ideas. And I think that's, it can be extremely helpful to have those conversations. And of course, I think sometimes it just confuses more people. Uh, thank you again. I'm Dan John from danjohnuniversity.com. And, you know, until next week, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye.